right. So here on our episode 100 spectacular, we're going to get into uh, a, a, an incredible special guest. You probably know him best as the current director of player development for the Blue Jackets. Uh, but did you know before that he was the top overall pick in the 2002 draft for the Young Jackets team? He would go on to become the face of the franchise. And during his 15 year career, he was a league leader in scoring a six time all star. And his number 61 is about to hang in the rafters at Nationwide Arena. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Beers podcast, Rick Nash. Rick, thank you so much for joining us here today. Happy to be here and looking forward to uh, catching up with you guys. Yeah, that's great, man. Now, it'll be one thing you also forgot, Mike. Uh, Rick has over 800 career points in over 1,000 uh, games played in the NHL. Now, Rick, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you before we get into the you know meat and potatoes of the interview is... Uh, <laughs> I, I know when a guy reaches that a thousand game plateau, the boys uh, all get together, put pool their money, and uh, get get a gift for the guy. Yeah, so I mean, what what what'd you get? Did you get a you know a Rolex, a golf cart? I know you're a golfer. Some guys get like tricked out golf carts. What what'd you get for that thousand games? Yeah, that's a good uh, good question. So uh, funny enough, the guys in New York when I played my uh, one thousand game, um, they got me a a set of golf clubs a golf bag. And then the Rangers got me a, a, a golf trip for, for me and my family. So it was, uh, it, it, you know what, it, it's a huge accomplishment as a, uh, as an NHL player. And we got Jake Voracek uh, coming up on his 1000 games, but uh, you know, there's not many players who, who have done it. So it was a special, uh, special achievement for me. Now, where did the, go where was the golf trip at? The, or, and second part of that question, are you like, Putting a little uh, birdie into the, putting a little hint into the guy's ears is what to get Jake. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I know Jake likes golf, but um, I'm not sure what the guys have done. It, it kind of stays in, internal, uh, you know, down in the room until they present it, uh, you know, during the game. Um, uh, funny enough that uh, I got to do the whole fitting for, for my golf clubs, and I can uh, I can guarantee you that it hasn't helped my golf game at all. <laughs> I still uh, yeah. still slice it into the woods and and uh, you know looking for balls all the time. But um, you, you know what, golf has been a, has been a great hobby of mine, and and I've always I've always kept it a hobby, and and uh, you know never get frustrated. But um, as for the golf trip that the the Rangers the Rangers got me. Um, we, we ended up just doing a family trip uh, instead and, and hung out with the kids. Oh, nice. I feel like everybody that golfs that's not very good at it, myself included, uh, I tell myself that too. Like, oh, I don't get frustrated. I'm just whacking balls in the woods. It's a good time uh, until I'm out there and I've lost my seventh ball of the round. And I'm like, what is happening out here? <laughs> yeah, the funny, the funny thing is I've always told myself that I, I had to work on hockey. Hockey was my profession. So I, I took that serious. And then golf, you know, it obviously becomes frustrating, but I, uh, I try to keep it a hobby. I still do that thing where I played baseball growing up. So I still do that thing where I'm like, oh, I got a baseball swing. So it's not good for golf. As if I've played <laughs> baseball in the last 20 years of my life. <laughs> I don't think it's still affecting me. Last question on that. Last question. Uh, who are some of the best sticks you've played with? I know there are some hockey players who are just incredible golfers. Yeah, you're right. Um, and, and funny enough, a lot of guys use that excuse with the short backswing uh, slap shot. <laughs> yeah. So if, yes. I've heard that one. Um, I'm thinking, you know, Blue Jacket guys, Ray Whitney, Mike Sillinger, they were, they were very good golfers. Um, in New York, we had a uh, kid, JT Miller, who's actually an Ohio kid that plays out in Vancouver yeah. now. He's a, he's a golfer. Um, and, and now in the room today, I, I hear Gus Nyquist is a, uh, is a very good golfer. I haven't had the opportunity to play with him yet, but I think those are some of the, uh, the best players that I've played with. That's all right. We're not going to, we're not going to tell our former uh, guest and buddy of the show, RJ Umberger, that you didn't bring him up uh, on his, because he does his <laughs> RJ Umberger golf trip every year. Yeah. Have you I ever been, been invited to that? Uh, no, I haven't been invited, but I have played many rounds with RJ and uh, his golf game is like his hockey game. He's gritty. He works 110%. <laughs> and he's a guy that you want on his team, but um, you know, there's some mistakes. There's some holes in his golf game. No question. That's, that's the big, I think that's the quote that's coming out of this interview. Uh, Rick Nash, uh, listen, when it comes to you and hockey, uh, let's start with the thing that's got the fifth line of buzz this year. And that is, the announcement that there's finally going to be a jersey hanging up in the rafters at Nationwide Arena, and that jersey is yours. And I know you've talked about it a lot, uh, but you know, 
just kind of walk us through your experience as, as you found out, we all saw the video and it was amazing. Uh, you're down in the locker room with the guys, your family shows up. Uh, just talk about your experience and, and, you know, what a, what a moment that was for you. And if, if that was, if that was surreal for you to go through that. Yeah. You know, what's funny is um, I, I didn't really have any expectations of it happening. Um, you know, obviously it was a dream of mine and I would love for it to happen, but you, you don't really sit on it and, and wait for it to happen. And I think it was a few weeks before the Detroit lions did something with Spielman where they had him reading the yes. uh, teleprompter and I was watching it and I almost had a tear in my eye and I'm like, oh, man, like, I, I don't think I'd ever fall for something like that. So <laughs> then uh, obviously Todd Chirac comes in with this huge plan two weeks before and, you know, uses uh, the ESPN show and they're going to do a, a day in the life thing. And, you know, it didn't even really hit me that it was a, that it was all a setup and you know, I banged out a 25 minute interview, which I thought I crushed, but you know, then after <laughs> they told me they were never going to use it or anything. So it, it was, it was incredible. And I give Todd Chirac and the Columbus Blue Jackets a lot of credit. I had no idea. And then uh, to pull me in, the, the funny thing was I walked in the room and I had the cameras following me and I was standing out around the corner. The last thing I wanted to do was go in the middle of the room and, you know, have 25 NHL players look at me and, and why is the cameras following this guy? Like, hasn't this guy retired and <laughs> isn't he done? Give it up. So right, it was right. funny. Todd, Todd kept pushing me into the middle of the room and I'm like, I don't need to be in the middle of the sure. room. I saw, I saw Mr. McConnell give this speech, you know, 10, 10 times in my career. And he's like, just go. They, they want you to be part of it. So it, it, it was funny how it all turned out. And then down my family there, um, you know, I'll tell you two guys, it was just a, a, a complete honor of mine to, uh, to have that, uh, you know, this whole thing done for me. Yeah, that was the part I, you know, Chad and I are both dads. We have young kids. Uh, and, and that was the part when I'm watching that video, just seeing your kids run up and giving you a hug. And, uh, you know, you talked about watching the Spielman thing. I was crying like a baby in the Spielman thing. And then I'm watching your kids come up and hug you and the, just the look on your face. I'm like, oh, well, here, we're going to go ahead and do this again. Uh, so uh, ran through Kleenex pretty quickly there uh, during that video. But yeah, just uh, just what a cool thing. And, and one thing that's interesting to me is as a team sport athlete, right, as a hockey player, your whole career, you're talking about team accomplishments. And it's and it's it's hard to talk about individual things. Do I want to be the MVP? Do I want you know, do I want to do this? Do I want to be a Hall of Famer? Do I want this? But in the end, like to talk about yourself for a second, to know that your name is in the rafters of a building forever. And, and, and long after you're gone and kids and grandkids and all that stuff, as long as the Columbus hockey team is going, your name's going to be hanging there. Just, you know, like, do you get a chance to like step back and really think like, man, that is crazy. How, how I was able to pull that off. Yeah. You, you, hit the kind of the most emotional thing for me was just thinking that it's, it's going up in the rafters and you know when when my kids bring their grandkids to nationwide arena um you know there's going to be a 61 nash uh banner in the in the rafters and that kind of really hits home um for me and that was kind of my first uh, first thought but you're right too and when, when you think of you know the individual kind of success or award but you know, there's been so many people that have been part of this, whether it's a coach or uh, training staff, medical staff, um, teammates, obviously. And then you start thinking about everyone that got you to the NHL. So it, at the time, I was kind of in shock. But afterwards, once you start thinking of these different things that we just talked about, it, it does really become emotional. So we talked just talked about the end uh, here. Now, let's go back to the beginning for a minute here, Rick. You know, you're a kid from Brampton, Ontario. You know, you played your junior hockey in London, you know, and coming out of London, you know, get, getting scouted by Doug and, and, and everything, it, it sounded like playing on a line was, was going to be a new thing for you as when, when Doug asked you what line you played on, you, you said, I don't really play on a line. I just kind of go on, out, out there every second shift and uh, whoever plays with me is going to play with me. Uh, you know, talk about that experience of getting scouted. Did you get a sense that it was going to be the Jackets the whole time? Uh, what was that, what was that process like for you? Yeah. So it was, it was kind of funny. Um, you know, it, it was interesting to go through all those meetings and I, Florida had the first overall pick that year and I flew down to, uh, to Florida and 
met with all the Florida uh, brass and, and all those guys and met with, um, I believe Atlanta had the second pick and met with, um, with Columbus and, and Doug always kind of tells a story a little different. And, uh, you know, there's, there's three sides to every story, but, um, the way I tell it is, uh, is, is a bit different than the way he tells it was my meeting was, was the night before the draft with Doug and Columbus. And they probably had about seven different guys sitting around the table and he was asking me questions and, and then asked me where I wanted to be drafted to. And at the time, Florida had the uh, had the first overall pick, and I knew they were high on uh, Jay Bomeister and wanted to kind of build a D-man. I knew Atlanta had uh, Danny Heatley and Ilya Kovalchuk, two forwards, and then Columbus was sitting at three, and I, I told him, I said, I thought Columbus was a good fit. You guys drafted uh, Rusty Klesla as, a, as your D-man. You guys have Pascal Leclerc as your goalie, and what an opportunity for a young forward to kind of come in. And he told me he was worried that someone else was going to trade up into the spots to get me. And I, as polite as possible, said, well, then we're going to have to figure something out. And he tells the story that I said, well, then you better jump up to first to draft me. And I think <laughs> from the five minutes we've been on here, I hope you guys don't think that's uh, my personality. So anyways, oh, I, no, give all God, the, no. I give all the credit to, uh, to Doug. He, um, you know, he, he put the, uh, put his name on the line and the organization wanted me and, he made that trade with, with Florida to jump up. And um, that's how, how it kind of went down the night before the draft. And I was sitting there with my family at the ACC in, uh, in Toronto. And I remember Gino Retta, who's a TSN uh, reporter, came running up to me about two minutes before they announced uh, the trade uh, live into the public and said, you won't believe this, Columbus just traded for the first overall pick. And then, I mean, talk about butterflies then. That was uh, unbelievable. So it's, it's a little, we talked about this a lot. We're, we're, we're based out of Cleveland. We've talked about this a lot with a guy like LeBron James, right? Which we, we saw up here, uh, but you've got a, a similar kind of situation where you came in with, with a lot of hype. I mean, you, you uh, uh, were the number one, obviously overall player. You're a young kid, especially in hockey, man, getting drafted as a young kid. Uh, you come in and you sign the largest contract that a rookie has ever signed at the time. And so the expectations on you, must have been it must have felt like about a hundred elephants just sitting on your shoulders of uh, just feeling those expectations you sign that contract uh and 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 it must have just been crazy pressure and yet you come out and you exceeded it every step of the way and and you met those expectations uh my one question on that is like you step in your first game with the blue jackets and you score a goal so you got all these expectations. You're the number one pick. You're like, you're like the shiny toy for the blue jackets and you step in and you score a goal, your first game. Uh, how much does that help? You're the first player that's done that since Mario Lemieux, the first top overall pick that scored a goal in his first game since Mario Lemieux. How much does that help? Like relieve some of that tension and be like, okay, I'm here. I'm ready to play. Yeah, it, it helped a lot. Um, you know, it, as a high draft pick, you always have these expectations around you, um, you know, being a top 10, top five, and then you're the number one overall. So you, so you figure that this organization has put this confidence in you to draft you before any other person born in 1984. So you, you have all this pressure around you. And you know what? I, I had guys uh, on the team like Kevin Deneen, um, you know, Luke Richardson came shortly after and, and all these veterans that helped me, uh, Tyler Wright, that kind of helped me adjust to the NHL game. But there, there was a lot of pressure. And, and I do find myself very lucky to come to a market like Columbus, Ohio, where they were going in their third season. We were still in the honeymoon <laughs> stage of having an NHL franchise. It wasn't like I was stepping into, uh, you know, uh, Toronto as, as the number one pick overall. So I, I did have some wiggle room on the expectations of a first overall pick. Um, there, there was a lot of pressure. I feel like where the pressure really hit me was about in my second or third season where, you know, I, I kind of became the face of the organization. And as for a 20 year old to be the face and have all this pressure, that's where I felt even more pressure than the, uh, than the first overall pick. Yeah, but it, it's it's got to be interesting to look back. You know, you look back at young. It's weird to call you not young, Rick Nash. We're all the same age, pretty much in this. And when you've played an entire hockey career, we talk we talk about guys like ah, oh, they're pretty old, and we're the same age. Um, uh, but when you look back at young Rick Nash, like there's got to be like a, a just a bit of a sense of pride in that. 
you know, you came in with those expectations and a lot of guys crumble. A lot of guys crumble uh, because it's hard. You know, I, I think that's something that doesn't get talked about enough. You know, we talk about, we analyze, right? Draft picks and this guy was a bust or that guy didn't live up to expectation. But we, we sometimes fail to talk about like, it's because that's really, really, really hard to do when you've got all those expectations on you. Do you look back with just, you think like, man, that I am, I am proud of what I was able to accomplish and that I was able to kind of live up to that and, and do it in a way that you, I'm sure kind of, you know, like you said, makes, makes you proud, makes your kids proud as they look at your career and all that stuff. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. We sh we, we should definitely look back at more positives. You know, it seems like we, we always, and, uh, and I'm guilty of it too. You look at a negative story and a bust or a, uh, you know, a kid that just didn't crack out the way he was supposed to be. And, and those stories are so much more intriguing um, when it comes to failure. And it's, it's, it's too bad, but there, there is a lot of pressure. And now that, now that I look back, um, I, I am proud of the way I've handled things. But as an 18-year-old kid, I can't take all the credit for it. it. It's the people that I've surrounded myself with. It's the people that my parents surrounded me with um that that helped me kind of succeed uh they've always put me in in positions to succeed and as as i look back and kind of have kids of my own now you know th there's a certain point where you can only lead them to and then they got to do the rest but i'll tell you from coaches to to teammates they always led me in the uh in the right direction and and it was it was hard you know i remember being 18 or 19 and having my dad come down on weekends when he was working full time and we were trying to figure out on where I was going to live. And, you know, nowadays when you have a young 18 year old come in, they probably put you with families and stuff like that, but it wasn't like that in 2002. And I remember me and my dad going to a, uh, to a uh, mortgage meeting on, on how to, how, how to uh, get a mortgage for myself for a house. And I remember leaving that and having my buddies call in and they were in college getting ready to go to a, uh, a keg party or something yeah, or right. tailgating. And it was just kind of hit me there how fast you have to grow up. So I, I, I was lucky that my, uh, my mom and dad were very supportive in the, in the right ways when I was young. Do any of these guys on the team, because we've got some guys now on the team, on the Blue Jackets, you've got, you know, you, you talked about Mike Sillinger. Well, we've got Cole on the Blue Jackets now. Are, are any of these young guys, you know, uh, are, do you find you're able to kind of reach out to them and kind of try to help them along in that process? Because it's got to be, I think of myself when I'm 18. I'm, I'm mid to late thirties now, and I'm still an idiot. Like uh, just being able to handle that stuff at 18, go to a mortgage meeting at 18. I was like your buddies. I was in some dorm room somewhere, probably not doing what I was supposed to do. Like that's, that's basically what I was doing at 18. So are you able to kind of step in and, and provide some words of wisdom to some of the young guys? Yeah, you know, it, it's kind of funny that when you're in the grind, like a Cole Sillinger is right now, and he's got, you know, his, his coaches talking to him, he's got his peers talking to him, he has his agent talking to him, he has his parents talking to him, and he's a real mature kid. So if, if you're going to break, break in in this league at 18 and, you know, do the travel schedule of back-to-backs, um, you know, being on the road and going across country, you, you have to be mature. Now I I've have met with Cole and I've, I've told him every single time I talk to him, if he ever has any questions or needs any help or any support, um, you know, to, to reach out to me, I'm here as a resource in, in player development, but he's, I, I will say he's a special kid. Now where it gets tricky is someone like Chinnikov who, who comes over, doesn't really speak English. It's new culture, it's new league. Jeez. So we, we really in, in Columbus here, we really try to set him up, whether it's a, uh, another Russian player or, you know, people in the Russian community that can uh, really help him and make sure he feels comfortable. The only way these kids are going to succeed at the NHL level is if they're comfortable off the ice. So in my position now, I really make sure that they, uh, they feel that way. Now let's fast forward to 2008, 2009, Rick, you know, you, you, you had some, you had some, you know, you had some really good years from you and a few other players, you know, during the team, but then you score that goal in, in uh, against Chicago. Fedor scores the lone goal in the shootout. You finally punch that ticket to the postseason. Did it just, again, those hundred elephants that were on your back coming into the organization, did it feel like about 50 to 60 of them came off your shoulders when that happened? 
Yeah, you're you're right. I mean, that's when that's when the pressure really hit me is when I, uh, you know, kind of got the captain and then uh, was the true leader, the true face of the uh, of the organization. And, you know, a team that's been around for eight years at the time that hasn't even sniffed a, a playoff game. Um, it was uh, it was an emotional time. That was the uh, the year before our owner passed away and and that year we wore the uh, the crest of, of his initials on our uh, on our jersey. Um, I still go back and watch that goal, and everyone else asks me what's, what's my my most important goal, and, and you hit it. That is that is, and I yes. I remember the feeling of that puck crossing the line, and just the uh, the weight coming off my shoulders for not only for me and our team and the players, but for the city and for the fans of. Uh, of the blue jackets it it really hit home and you know obviously the playoffs didn't go well that year and we got swept by detroit but it was it was a huge moment in our organization to uh to get to that next level you know you talked about the captaincy you talked about some of the stuff going on that year something else going on that year too that i'm very interested to find out because we've had some cool people on this podcast but i don't think we have had yet to this point on this podcast a cover athlete of a video game and you were the cover athlete of NHL 2K9. Uh, and that happened before that year as well, I believe. Yeah, that was before that year. So, uh, like, what, do they call you? Like, are you, first of all, were you a video game guy? Did you play NHL 2K? And did they, was that, like, what was that process like of them being like, listen, we want you on the cover? Because, like, there's a lot of stories about cursed athletes on covers of video games. So is there a little hesitancy there? Yeah, you definitely, you definitely know those, those rumors of the, uh, of the video game cover. And then, uh, you know, the next season doesn't usually go too well, but it it was great. I grew up playing, uh, playing video games and, um, you know, if if we weren't outside playing road hockey, then we were inside playing video games, uh, whether it was hockey or or football or or whatever (laughs) the game was, it was, it was always gaming at night. And once I moved to London, um, and started playing for the Knights me and my roommate, Logan Hunter, we, we would game, you know, every single downtime we had. So it was a part of my life. Getting the call from 2K was, was really cool. Uh, me and my agent, Joe Resnick, we flew out to San Francisco and we did the, the whole tour of, of what they had going on. Um, we got to do some commercials. Uh, you know, we got to do some, um, some shows where we went to the game shows and got to play, uh, you know, the system and got to play against fans. And, and obviously gaming wasn't what it was uh, then as it is now. Right. Um, but it was, it was still awesome. And I mean, I'm still a fan of the game. So to sit here with you guys and, and talk about being on a cover of, uh, of, a, of an NHL game, it's something that I would, I would only dream of as a, as a kid and as a fan. That's exactly what I was just thinking. Like if I was one of your buddies growing up, I don't know if I'd be more excited that like my good buddy, Rick is like killing it in the NHL or that he's on the cover of a video game. Like, I don't know which one would make me more excited. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll tell you when, you know, in 2002 from about 95 or whenever it came out 98, when you could start making your own player and you make yourself and then you play as yourself. And then yeah. in 2002, you buy the game and you're in the lineup. I mean, talk about a moment where you, you can actually pinch yourself and say, I've made it. I'm in a video game. So uh, I'm glad you guys appreciate kind of the, that take on it because it's, it's true for, for someone from, from my generation. Yeah. Once you made, once you made the video game, you made it. Who cares about everything on the ice? <laughs> did, you, did, did you guys, okay. Quick little, quick little off that. Did you guys have Sega? Did you play NHL 94? Like the, when, when you guys would fight and like the blood would just come out of the guy's head on the ground. Did you guys have that or no? Yeah, we had, we had Sega. And then even before that, we had Nintendo, the old ice hockey where you'd pick, yeah. you know, the speedy guy, then the medium yes. sized guy. And, the, and blades of steel. Just pick a color. Exactly. Blades yeah, of steel. Blades. Just pick a color. Right. So we had, uh, <laughs> we went through all those, uh, all those different generations of games. Oh my God. All right, Rick. Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. No, no, no. It's all you, Chad. Oh, okay. I was going to say, Rick, you know, so sticking with that season for a second, that that brought about one of my favorite memories of of watching you uh, and the Blue Jackets growing up, and and that nobody ever talks about. Okay? And I I think you probably know what I'm leading, uh, getting on to here, but it was uh, a game in Detroit, okay? And it was your unassisted hat trick in Detroit. 
again, nobody really talks about this uh, because, I don't know, for lack of a better term, it was a, just a thorough ass whooping of the Red Wings <laughs> in that game that night. But nobody ever talks about it. It's an unassisted hat trick is something that hasn't happened in over 70 years. Like your name is synonymous with Rocket Richard, Rick. And like, well, I mean, and there was a little bit of controversy about his unassisted hat trick. There, <laughs> but we're not, we're, we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about that. Uh, I don't know. What are like, what, what does that get? What, I don't know. What are the memories of that game for you? Is that you talked about important goals? How cool were those goals for you? What are, what are, I don't know. What are, I guess, what are some of other, your, your other favorite goals? And you're not allowed to say the Arizona or the blues one either. What are some of your <laughs> other favorite goals in the memory of your hockey career? You know, what's funny about that hat trick is um, I think it's one of the most underrated feats like, ever in my career ever yes ever and we did a story with it with Aaron Port's line it, it might have been two years ago or on one of the anniversaries of it and you know he brought up the point that you brought up with uh, the Rocker Richards one there was some oh, yeah. sort of some sort of <laughs> iffy stuff going on with it but to think that that's never happened in the history of our game is incredible and I, I totally agree with you I'm surprised I didn't know at the time, but when me and uh, Portsline did that story, it kind of hit me that I'm surprised that this isn't talked about more, and I'm surprised that no one ever brings it up to me. I would honestly say you're probably the third person that, that has brought it up to me, and that's, yes. uh, that's impressive. No. <laughs> you, guys have, you guys have done your, uh, your homework. So yeah. um, for all those years, I didn't even really see it as a big deal until we did the story about it, and then I, uh, I thought it was pretty amazing. Um, yeah, the, the goals that you touched on are all great goals. Um, I scored for Team Canada in the uh, in the Olympics in the quarterfinals against Russia. Uh. That's up. That's up there as one of my favorite goals. Um, in in Columbus, I think my my first one was the biggest one. Chicago is by far my biggest in my career. And then I scored one other goal in the world championship in a gold medal game against Finland that uh, kind of put the stamp on the gold medal. Um, that, that's probably it. But besides those, um, that, the, that Detroit uh, hat trick <laughs> on assist is, uh, is right up there. Now you guys got me thinking about it now and I'm, I'm still lost for words. <laughs> no, it was, you know, it, again, it's, it's it, what's cool about having the conversation, no matter where you are or how big you got or how much time you spend in the league. What's cool about having the conversation is just, uh, and people can't see this as we're talking, uh, but like you, I, you, Rick's talking about these goals. And when you talked about the goal that sent the blue jackets to the postseason, you kind of closed your eyes and you can almost see you like go back to that moment for a minute. And I think that's the cool thing. You scored a ton of goals. You, you scored mo more goals than most people that have ever played the game of hockey. Uh, you played more games than most people that have ever played the game of hockey. And yet you still kind of can transport yourself back and like feel those feelings and those emotions in, in those games. And that's, you know, like, again, that to me is about part of that, like real person type thing. We, I've talked about a lot of, of athletes being talked about as athletes, but it's like that, you know, there's Rick, the guy from Canada that is just, you can take yourself back and feel these goals. Uh, and I just, I think that's really cool to hear you talk about. Yeah. But you know what, there's, there's one thing that I missed. Well, there's a lot of things that I miss about being in the game. And the, the, the main thing is the camaraderie with the guys. I mean, you're, you're, you're going to battle every night or every other night with 25 brothers. And that's, that's the toughest thing to get away from. And the next thing is that, that rush of scoring a goal, listening to the fans go crazy, listening to the cannon going off. There's no rush that can simulate that. Um, so I can close my eyes luckily enough and bring myself back to some of those, uh, situations. I think of, of the clock with two minutes and 30 seconds on it before you come out of the tunnel, the lights are off, the music's playing, you got <laughs> 19,000 fans standing, swinging towels for a playoff game. There's no, there's no rush in a hockey fan or a sports fans world that can simulate that. And those are things that I tried to take in towards the end of my career. I wish I would have took them in earlier, but I knew it was coming to an end and I took them in so I can close my eyes and go back to that because that's, that's truly what I miss. And it still gives me goosebumps to go back and think about those days. 
Honey, I'm going skydiving. Uh, I'm going rock climbing without any ropes. I need a rush. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I need a rush. <laughs> now it's now it's now I wait in the car pickup line at the uh, at school and see how early I can get the kids, and that's my rush. If I can get there and be one of the yeah, first you're ones to pick them up, that's you're right. racing there. <laughs> Look who's in second, Todd. Uh, uh, that's right. So listen, uh, it, it's it, it it's still not even fun to talk about the move to New York, but but do t- t- tell tell us a little bit about like. So you go from Columbus, you, you're the face of the franchise. You are, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you've been a part of finally the first playoff run. Again, things didn't, you know, things tailored off a little bit after that. But then the team decides, you know, they're going to go in a different direction. You go off to New York, uh, you know, going from one of the youngest franchises in hockey where you were, oh, you know, you, you joined them just a few years into their existence to an original six in the biggest city in the country what is that you know does that take some of that pressure and put it back on you and now you're in front of the new york fans and rangers fans uh and then and then what are some of the differences you know between columbus we hear it a lot and i never understand if it's a real thing or not we hear it a lot about media like oh if you're in cleveland the media in new york is so much different or they're so much harder to deal with is that is that true like you just kind of talk about that move over there to new york yeah just to touch on the uh, media I guess it's it's kind of what you buy into um you know and I feel like in Columbus I can't speak for for Cleveland and for what goes on there but in Columbus you know you can kind of hide there's you know there's two or three reporters there's one camera if something big happens (laughs) and in in somewhere like New York it's just you're you're under the microscope so so nothing can kind of fly under the radar and that's what makes it harder is that in in Columbus you know, we, we expected it early on. I'm talking about, we expected a good effort in 110% in New York. You know, if you give 110% and don't score in two or three games, then, you know, you might not be getting dinner reservations or people <laughs> might be chirping you when you're out for dinner. So that's, that stuff, that, that's kind of where it becomes different. Um, as, as for the move, I can honestly say that I planned on spending my whole career as a blue jacket. And I, you know, I've only ever signed contracts with the Blue Jackets. So I think that kind of speaks for itself. I've never signed with another team. And before I was going to retire, I was going to sign back with the Blue Jackets and, and, and uh, get a deal done here. So I, I never had intention of leaving. Um, we just, you know, that year after the playoffs and, and then, you know, we, we gave away some, some young talent and brought in some older guys that, that didn't work out and brought in a coach, a new coach, and then that didn't work out. And, I didn't want to leave, but I went to management and I asked them what the game plan was. You know, I'm, I'm 28 now or 27. Uh, I've been the captain for a few years. And ever since I was 18, you guys have told me that you're going to build a team around me. So what's, what's going on? We have four playoff games to, to speak of. And they, they, they told me, and again, I've been upfront with, with everyone about this. And, and I didn't, I didn't let the story out at the time because, I wanted to take the, uh, the high road, but, you know, they told me they wanted to start a new rebuild and to give them three or four years and, and we're, we're going to do it. So that brings me to 31, 32. That's almost on the backside of my prime. So I said to them, I said, why not start this rebuild that you guys are talking about by trading me and getting as many young pieces as, as you guys can and send me to a contender where I can uh, live out my dream of, of winning a Stanley Cup. And yeah. at first they were, at first they were against it. Um, but after they had their meetings, they were, they were with me. So I feel like I kind of got thrown under the bus on, on my exit Yeah. when I was up front the whole time. And, and those years, those years sucked coming back here. That was tough for me to get booed in this building. Um, you know, without everyone knowing the full story of, of how everything went down, um, I feel like some things should be kept in-house. I thought that should have been kept in-house and I didn't really get to tell my side of the story, nor did I want to play that game of he said, she said. So at the end of the day, I'm happy it's come full circle and I wouldn't change anything for my six years in New York. I mean, to get to play at MSG 41 times, (laughs) um, you know, celebrities in the stands, stars in the stands, blue shirts, is a real thing in New York. I mean, you, you know, you got your Knicks, you got your Giants, you got the Yankees. 
New York loves their hockey. And for me, coming from Toronto and growing up a diehard Maple Leaf fan, to get a chance to play for an original six, yeah. um, I wouldn't change it for anything. Well, well there's like, a, oh, go ahead, Jess. No, I was, I was just going to make a comment. So weird, huh? You're 27, 28. You're, you, you wanted to win a Stanley Cup? Rick? You didn't <laughs> yeah, want to go yeah. through a rebuild? Weird. <laughs> Yeah, but well, not a lot of not a lot of people understood that, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's yeah. it's it's so fair, and and again, it just brings it back to that. Like, if I went to my job and said, "Hey, I'm going to go do something else," it, nobody's booing me when I leave the building. You know what I mean? Like, or or you know, this it's just a very real life situation. It just plays out on a professional sports team, and so it's just so much bigger than anybody else ever has to deal with. But uh, yeah, you made it pretty well known that that it was hard for you coming back, but uh, but then in the end, Rick and, and and to back where we are now, you're back, and and now you're the uh, you know uh, uh, player personnel director or director of player development. Um, uh, so you've came you've come back to Columbus. Was that always the plan for you? Because we hear that a lot from people. Is the plan is always to come back to Columbus, and then. Uh, this is kind of kickstarting a new career for you. Essentially you're still in hockey, but on the front office. And so like, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> yeah. Right. I know it's, it's, it's funny for, just to touch on your first part of that question is I've never, I never left Columbus. I, I've never sold my house. I, we always came back here in the summer. This was always home. So, you know, just to get that bad scoop of wanting to leave town and, you know, ask for a trade or demand a trade. It, it just wasn't the way it went down. And it's, it, I've always loved this city. Um, so it's kind of funny how it's come full circle. Now I'm back here working for the team and I'm very grateful for the, uh, for the McConnell family and, and Mike Priest and, and, and Yarmo for bringing me back in. And, you know, they obviously didn't have to do that. Um, as for the next, next chapter, it's funny when you're a professional athlete, it's, it's so front loaded that, you know, most people at, <laughs> 34 35 is are just kind of grabbing their feet in their career and and, and getting going and for us our, our career is over so there's a whole nother <laughs> chapter and and I, for two years I was kind of uh Yarmo shadow and just kind of followed him around and learned the business and uh you know I was very lucky got to sit in on all the uh the trade deadlines and the drafts and then the uh the trade calls and, and all these different things and then uh last summer he asked me if I wanted to tackle uh player development and um, I thought, why not? And Chris Clark, who uh, is the Cleveland Munsters GM there, was, was doing it for the past years. And he's really helped me and, and, and kind of guided me on, on how to do it. So it's been fun. And, you know, I, I kind of want to climb, keep climbing in the, uh, in the hockey ops. But at the same, same point, I want to take my time and make sure I go through the process right. And, um, you know, learn from, learn from these guys like Yarmo and Basil McRae and John Davidson and and uh, Josh Flynn and, and just kind of take my time and, and see where it leads. But I'm in, I'm in no rush. I'm happy in, in development. I'm happy in the front office right now. Now, one quick thing I want to ask you before I get, because I want to end on a, a couple of fun stories here, uh, Rick. But uh, <laughs> uh -oh. one thing I did want to ask you that I was always curious about, you know, so as development guys, you know, you have your, you know, you're the director of player development and you got, you know, the development coaches underneath you. Are you guys out on the road with the guys right now? Like, like you're not in Vancouver, right? Or, or, but are the other development guys working out there, helping working, uh, working on their craft? Yeah. So the development development coaches take on everyone that's in our in our umbrella that's not playing for the uh, for the big club. So okay. last weekend I was in Madison, Wisconsin, watching our uh, our first round pick, Corson Coolmans. Um, week before that, I was in uh, Ann Arbor watching our our guy Kent Johnson. Um, our development coach, Derek Dorsett is out in Quebec right now and then traveling to PEI to watch our two picks there. And then we have Yarko Rutu who's over in, uh, Europe checking out all our European guys. So we, we honestly, in this position, we don't do much with the big clubs. Okay. We're more so around all our draft picks and all our, uh, all our prospects. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for your time, Rick. I just, I just want to end with a couple of fun stories. I want to get your thoughts on these uh, before, before we let you go. I know we spent a little bit more time than expected, but we had so much fun talking to you. But uh, I wanted to ask you, and this is a pretty hard-hitting one, so I hope you're ready. Oh. Uh, 
Have you gotten yams that lifetime supply of key lime pie yet? Or is that still in the works? Is that something you <laughs> that that's a great one. So we <laughs> yeah, we we went down to a uh it was one of the all-star breaks. We were both playing in New York and we were with uh it was me, Yans and, and Ryan McDonough. We went down to Key West. And we went out for dinner and um you know what would you guys have for dessert if you're in Key West? Uh, I mean, key, key lime, lime pie, pie right? <laughs> key lime pie, yeah. yeah. Heaven. So I order key lime pie, and and Keith Gandel, who who truly is one of the best teammates I've ever played with, and he's one of the funniest guys in in the game, and and one of the nicest guys too, and one of the uh, the truest guys. Um, but he wouldn't let it go. Uh, he's a, <laughs> he has something against key lime pie. So I, I think when you're yeah for his one thousandth game. Um, you know, I told him I'll get him a lifetime supply of key lime pie, but I don't think he eats it. So it kind of worked out for worked out for me. Yeah, I heard. I heard he calls it burnt sour. Like that's what he calls it. it tastes yeah. like burnt sour. You know what? I was I was offended. I, I thought I thought we should all love key lime pie. I didn't know people had uh, people were against key lime pie, but um, yeah, Keith Keith's one of the best guys in the game and. I'm telling you what, you know, some people, sometimes people look, look over what someone can do for a dressing room and not even talking about on ice stuff. He is one guy that can make a team so much better just from his personality. Yeah. And that was my kind of like my one B question off this is like, is he easily in your top five funniest teammates you've ever, you've ever played with? And like, who are some of the jackets like jokesters that you, some people might not know of that were, were pretty funny. Yeah. So Tyler Wright, is up there. Tyler Wright was one of the funniest guys uh, I played with. Jeff Sanderson, he he was up there as a as a prankster. Um, uh, Keith, but Keith Yandel is is up there as one of the funniest guys. Mark Stahl, who's in uh, who's in D- Detroit now, he's he's a true character. Uh, Matt Matt Zuccarella, I mean these these guys are this this is the stuff that we're talking about right here is the stuff that. Yeah. Fans don't get to see, but it's the yes. stuff that play, players miss the most once they're out of the game. Right. Um, as for the jackets now, uh, I haven't been around the actual guys in the room enough, and especially with all the COVID protocols and yeah, and sure. me 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 traveling around, seeing our young guys, and and it's just it's it's too bad because that's that's kind of one of the best parts that you're you're touching on. Yeah. And that's definitely like, that's definitely what I like to try to look for, you know, is there some of the things just like fans don't get to see. So that's, that's great. Uh, the next one I'm worried, I'm, I, I'm very curious about is uh, I read Sean Pronger's book and do you order dinner last just out of habit now, if, <laughs> judging from that story? Do you know what story I'm talking about? Remind me which one so I can comment on it. <laughs> it's when you, it's uh, it's it's when your rookie year, when uh, you know, six of your guys, you guys went out to dinner, a nice little Italian dinner. You ordered the spaghetti and meat sauce and a and a diet coke. The check comes, and all of a sudden, your your twenty bucks doesn't cover it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know what? Funny enough, me and me and Sean Pronger, we lived uh, we lived literally beside each other my first year, and I was an eighteen year old kid, and he's one of the guys that really took took me uh, under his wing and kind of had me over for dinners. Um, the funny, funny story of, about that is, and it'll lead me on to another story. I don't want to bore you guys, but. Um, no, God, no, <laughs> yeah, no, no, you know. Yeah, no, you we're totally bored here. Bore us, right? Yeah, yeah you, right. you, you got to remember, I mean, I'm an 18 year old kid that, you know, has been eating at Denny's and, and, you know, different restaurants where you just pay for your own tab and, you know, you can't really run the tab up too high. So, when, when we would go out on nights off and, you know, you didn't play the next day and the guys would have a glass of wine and obviously I couldn't drink in the States or the guys would have, uh, you know, a beer or something. And the, uh, the bill comes and it's a hundred dollars per man. You're like, well, I only had spaghetti and, and a diet Coke. So I didn't even have any refills. So I, I don't know what, what to do here. And, you know, that, that leads me kind of to the next story is when, um, I got my first paycheck and uh, I, I called my dad and I said, I think there's some sort of mistake because there's a number at the top. That's a nice number. And the number at the bottom is half of the number at the top. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like something. So he had to explain to me, you know, what taxes are. Oh, now no. remember, remember at the time I haven't even finished high school and yeah. 
I don't know. They didn't teach us that in high school with the uh, with the taxes and you know all that stuff. So it, it's kind of funny, but it all comes back to how fast you have to grow up and how fast you have to mature if you're going to come in this league at a young age. Rick, I don't think you've ever said anything at any point in time that is going to make you more relatable to literally everybody than that story about taxes right there. Because <laughs> I still do that. I still look at my paychecks and I'm like, where, why is all of that gone? <laughs> true story. Yeah, true yeah. story. All right. And then the last story you want to want to ask you about there, Rick. Uh, we've had our good buddy, we've had him on a couple of times. We've had a great time with him. Dave Metzel has come on the podcast with us a couple of times and uh, has, has, has just chit-chatted with I asked him about uh, maybe something, uh, just, a, just a story, see if he had anything fun we could ask you about. And he told us to ask you about uh, him water skiing in Muskoka. In Muskoka. That, uh, what's, what's the story there? Yeah, so Mets, Mets is a great guy. He's a, he's a fun guy <laughs> to be around and a fun guy to talk to. Um, so they were doing a, a behind the uh, scenes of, of Blue Jacket players and what they do in the summer and how they work out and I think at the time Dave had a, a bad knee or, or now he has a bad knee. It's one or the other. So we took him, we took him water skiing. We took him water skiing behind the boat. And, uh, you know, I, I think he might've had a fall where he, where he banged up his knee and then kept going or his knee was, was banged up from, you know, going to see Mark Mathot in Ottawa or past, whoever it was. <laughs> But I, I'm telling you, you guys have to watch the footage of, of this show. And, and there was something going on with his knee because his, when he was, when I was pulling him behind the boat, his knee was almost at like a 90 degree angle oh, sideways. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. And I don't know if I, if I'm going to get a bill for that somewhere down the road and get the <laughs> bill of his knee, but um, yeah, they, we had, we had a great time up in Muskoka and he, uh, he still asked me about Muskoka. It's a great, uh, you know, uh, cottage country up on the lakes, about two hours north of Toronto. And, and I was glad that Dave got to come up and, uh, and spend some time with me. I feel like every NHL player has a lake house somewhere in North America, like in the off season. It, it comes with it. You can't say you're a hockey player unless yeah. you, you golf, yeah. right? You, you know, <laughs> yeah. kind of the slang words and, and you have a, you have a lake house or a cabin up in, uh, up in Canada. Yeah, standard NHL player contract says you must get a lake house somewhere in North America. That's it. First <laughs> half goes to taxes. Second half goes to your lake house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. That's right. The second contract makes up for that. Uh, Rick Nash, we're going to let you go. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this was awesome. Uh, more fun, I think, than, than uh, we could have even imagined. So we really, really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, good luck with everything you got going on in player development there with the Blue Jackets. And uh, we are very much looking forward to March uh, and to see the scenes down there in Columbus when, you're, when your name and number gets, uh, gets taken up into the rafters at Nationwide. Congratulations on everything. And, and we really, really appreciate your time. Well, thank you guys for having me. And, uh, you know, it's always, it's always fun going into the bones of, of, of these things and talking to you guys when, when you guys know the background of all these stories. So I appreciate you guys, um, you know, coming with these questions and, getting into the things that fans love to hear. So you guys did a great job. Thank you.